The stone fort at Pipe Spring stands as a reminder of the years between 1850 and 1900. People of the Kaibab Band of Paiute Indians, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, known as Mormons, and the United States government encountered one another in this place. They wrestled with their differences and left a story of lasting importance. My great-great-grandfather, he arrived in this area in 1883. Brigham Young and the Mormons thought, well, we'll take this great basin that nobody else wants. <laughs> nobody, that is, but the Native Americans whose ancestors had lived here for countless generations. We believe that we were created here on the Kaibab Plateau and this, this is where, this is our homeland. Pipe Springs was called Muk near Mukunta. Mukunta is the name of this, this line of mesas. When Mormons first came to this area, it was claimed by Mexico. Mormons had experienced violent opposition in New York, in Ohio, and again in Missouri, then Illinois. They moved beyond the U.S. border to be free to implement their faith's vision without interference. But soon a treaty between the United States and Mexico pushed the United States border all the way to the Pacific. What would U.S. sovereignty mean to this growing Mormon settlement and to the native people? Kaibab Paiutes lived in the region around Pipe Spring, and their homeland extended all the way to the Grand Canyon. Utes and Navajos passed through the area, sometimes raiding Kaibab Paiutes. During these decades, America embraced Manifest Destiny, believing in its right to spread constitutional democracy across North America. The rest of the country was involved in, in thinking, this land belongs to us, from sea to shining sea. Most Mormons were Americans, but their sense of destiny was different. They were trying to build a new Jerusalem. And Mormons viewed what they were doing as the beginning of building a kingdom that would eventually swallow up the entire West, all of the United States, all of North and South America, and ultimately the world. It was manifest destiny taken to the nth degree. American politicians and Mormon settlers alike considered themselves representatives of civilization. For many Americans, Indians were both uncivilized and in the way of westward expansion and progress. Some put it bluntly, the only good Indian is a dead Indian. But Mormon scripture identified Indians as descendants of Lamanites, who they believed to be members of a lost tribe of Israel. One of the first representatives of the United States government in this region was John Wesley Powell. As an explorer and ethnographer, Powell's attitude toward both Indians and Mormons was one of curiosity. His photographer, John Hillers, and artist Frederick Dellenbaugh made observations that could be sympathetic, but also patronizing or inaccurate. Powell came and took pictures of the Indians, dressed them up the way he thought Indians should look like. Because if he was going to take true pictures of the Paiutes, he would have been taking pictures of naked people. Maybe just wearing a small breech cloth out of some animal hide, women wearing skirts made out of bark that were just halfway and nothing on top. Could all these groups agree on how to use the land and its resources? on how to organize society and allocate authority. The U.S. Constitution guarantees free expression of religion. 
at Pipe Spring in the mid-19th century, Mormons and Kaibab Paiutes had different but deeply rooted spiritual practices. A typical morning, waking up early in the morning, you had elders standing outside, facing the horizon to the east, looking for the signs from the stars. When it was time to plant, it was time to harvest, by looking at the constellations. This is the way you're gonna to live today. This is what you're gonna do. For Kaibab Paiutes and Mormons, their leaders carried both sacred and secular authority. The Latter-day Saint kingdom was, was really that, a, a kingdom, uh, governmentally, economically, religiously, everything was intertwined. No separation of church and state. But the U.S. Constitution prohibits establishing a state religion and requires separation of church and state. We thought we could come out here and rule ourselves. And within just 10 years, here was the federal government coming to tell them what they could and couldn't do. The conflict with federal authority was inflamed after 1852, when the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints publicly announced that some of its members practiced polygamy. In the same decade, the U.S. was approaching open conflict over the issue of slavery. Northern politicians called slavery barbaric. They said the same of polygamy. In 1857, President James Buchanan sent 2,500 federal troops to impose U.S. authority on the Mormon Rebellion. So the whole Utah War, where about one-third of the Standing Army of the United States was sent to Utah, attached polygamy to, to the heart of constitutional issues that were causing our country to come apart at the seams. Mormon forces in the U.S. Army reached a standoff. The federal government named a new territorial governor. But Mormon settlers continued to accept Brigham Young as both prophet and governmental leader. Brigham Young continued to send settlers out to the frontier. He sent James Whitmore and his wife to settle at St. George. Whitmore took title to the land at Pipe Spring. The new ranch was at the center of a growing conflict between the Navajos and settlers. On the Arizona Strip, Navajos raided Mormon settlers' livestock. They were desperate after being driven from their homeland by the United States Army. In 1865, after what was almost certainly a Navajo raid, Whitmore and his ranch hand were killed as they tried to recover missing livestock. A search party found their bodies and found a group of Kaibab Paiutes. They find the circumstantial evidence on them. Dead man's clothing, dead man's gun, sheep meat, sheep skin. The emotion just got out of hand and he started firing. They, they killed all the, all the Paiute people. One man in the search party, Edwin D. Woolley, later ranch manager at Pipe Spring, didn't join the killing. He wrote, I never was so ashamed in all my life. The whole thing was so unnecessary. Both the Mormon church and the federal government encouraged settling, farming, and livestock grazing. And that meant both developing and owning the land and its resources, including water. Kaibab Paiutes thought of the land and water in a different way. Paiutes had them um, like stewardship of the springs. You know, Paiute family would have probably been the one to take care of that water. Always keeping it clean, never doing anything to contaminate it and talking to the water, telling the water what it was they were going to use it for. Bless my garden, you know, I'm planting a garden nearby. 
Water is for sharing. And the great creator was so good to us that he always shared the water with everything that he created. Settlers were staking claims in a region that was blank on U.S. maps. How could the federal government assert its authority to grant title to uncharted lands? With support from Congress, explorer John Wesley Powell's survey team put this region on the map. Powell detailed the contours, cliffs, and valleys, symbolically establishing U.S. sovereignty over the entire area. Most of the trails, most of the roads through the Grand Canyon um, and over, those are Indian trails. Those are Paiute trails. Powell found a useful friend in the Indian Chuaram Peak, who served as a guide for the expedition. Chuaram Peak was my grandfather's father. Well, my grandfather was uh, the one that uh, rescued Mr. Powell when he was lost out in the desert. Powell said of his guide, in the language of Chuar's people, a wise man is said to be a traveler. In the moonlight of the last evening sojourn in the camp on the brink of the canyon, I told Chuar that he was a great traveler. Both men seemed to know that knowledge was a form of power. Here at Pipe Spring, the United States, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and the Kaibab Paiute challenged each other's cultural identity. The Paiutes had small gardens, but also moved over thousands of acres, hunting game animals and gathering native plant foods. The new settlers lived differently. They occupied sites with water sources and diverted the water for themselves. Their livestock ate and trampled plants the Paiutes depended upon for seeds that were part of their diet. We were an agrarian culture. They had to have the, the farms. Could a farming and cattle raising society live side by side on the same land with a hunting and gathering society? But in the beginning, it's the clashing of culture, a clashing of religion, of lifestyle. In their day, they didn't view these Indians as having a civilization. Early Mormons came, saw the Paiutes, said they were diggers, noticed that they didn't have the same exact standards of cleanliness and what they chose to eat, and many Mormons spoke of their habits pejoratively. Misunderstandings were frequent. But what they did understand is if you let this white man dunk you into that water, he's gonna give you a bunch of things going to give you a new shirt, maybe a new hat, some flour, some coffee, that kind of thing. Well, they understood that, that if you allowed him to do that. The Mormon's primary missionary to the Indians of southern Utah and northern Arizona was Jacob Hamlin, and he was active in this area. Apparently he had learned the language, and so he could speak to the Indians and, you know, try to tell them about his religion. But you know what? The Indians had no concept of what this man was talking about. You know, they had their own belief system, their own religion. And he came with a totally foreign idea to these people. Many Mormon missionaries to the Indians became frustrated and embittered because they couldn't convert Indians in the way they thought they ought to be able to. But Jacob Hamblin began early to see things from the Indian's point of view. Surveyor John Wesley Powell employed both the Paiute, Chihuahuan Peak, and the Mormon missionary Jacob Hamblin for their knowledge of the region and its people. Their collaboration suggests that cooperation and mutual understanding were possible between individuals, but finding common purpose between whole cultures was harder. The Mormons worked efficiently and systematically to fulfill their vision. Here at Pipe Spring on the advancing frontier, facing Navajo raids, Brigham Young and Anson Windsor laid out plans for building the stone fort that would be called Windsor Castle. 
At the time it was built, Brigham Young was looking toward moving massive numbers of Latter-day Saints into Arizona with a, a view eventually to spreading them into New Mexico and in, into Mexico. And having forts and way stations and protected water holes in Mormon possession along these important trails were fundamental. I think the creation of the fort, because it was over the water source, it excluded our people from the water source. And of course that was the intention. This is the desert. They were trying to hold the water, have the water for themselves and have the water for their livestock. And just seeing them, the deer herd moving away, and this other herd comes in. Losing the antelope, the bigger game, being replaced by this monstrous beast called a cow. It's a new behavior of ownership, which the Paiute people didn't understand. Windsor Castle was headquarters for a Mormon church ranching operation that ran church-owned cattle on thousands of acres on the Arizona Strip. Here at headquarters, range cows provided milk that women in the fort turned into butter and cheese. Food from Pipe Spring supplied the crew building the Mormon temple at St. George. Brigham Young and his successors named the managers of this tithing ranch. Pipe Spring was typical of the system of church-owned enterprises in the Mormon system of settlement and economic development. Perhaps it would be possible for different spiritual understandings to coexist, but such different uses of land could not be reconciled. In 1880, Jacob Hamblin wrote to his old friend John Wesley Powell, now the chief of the Bureau of Ethnology at the Smithsonian in Washington. He said, the Kanab or Kaibab Indians are in very destitute circumstances. Fertile places are now being occupied by the white population. He continued, the foothills that yielded hundreds of acres of sunflowers, the grass also that grew so luxuriantly, plants that produced for the natives is all eat out by stock. Intensive grazing by livestock placed the Paiute's very survival at risk. The majority of the people left. It was big, one of the biggest decisions, only possible thing they can do, cutting ties with that water. For many years, the federal government seemed to take little notice of the Kaibab Paiute's plight. But its quarrel with the Mormons was ongoing. Congress and Utah's territorial government targeted church control of the economy and, of course, polygamy. Mormon leaders had long thought that a state government elected by Utah citizens would be better than a territorial government controlled from Washington. After years of federal pressure and as a step toward statehood, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints issued an official proclamation that announced an end to polygamy. But for a time, the practice continued. Pipe Springs isolation made it a useful refuge for plural wives as federal marshals arrested polygamists. One of the things that was hardest for the polygamous women was to be taken into court and have to testify that you were a second wife or a third wife. And so they were afraid of this. When ranch manager Edwin D. Woolley moved his second wife Flora here, she wrote, I went to prison to keep my husband out. Another manager, Daniel Siegmiller, brought his third wife, Emma, here to avoid detection by federal marshals. She can't live in Orderville or, or in uh, Upper Kanab where Daniel is because she's going to have a baby. So she comes here with other polygamous wives. 
the women were really quite in control here. They were running things. The threat of the law was real. My great-grandfather Thomas had six wives, so he spent six months in the state penitentiary because of plural marriage. But as soon as he got out, he moved his third wife, Ann Carlene, and his uh, fourth wife, Ellen Carlene, who's my great-grandmother, to Pipe Springs to, to try to get out of uh, the marshal's sights. Plural marriages didn't disappear overnight, but the Latter-day Saints Church did get out of its role of running the economy. It sold off businesses like Pipe Spring. The Mormon Tithing Ranch became a privately owned cattle ranch. By 1896, Utah's Mormons had relinquished church involvement in government and commerce and their religious doctrine concerning plural marriage. In exchange, they achieved Utah's admission as the 45th state. In 1907, the federal government established a reservation for the Kaibab Paiute, recognizing in perpetuity the tribe's right to 188 square miles of their ancestral homeland. When National Park Director Stephen Mather visited Pipe Spring in the 1920s, he took a keen interest in its history. Pipe Spring was proclaimed a national monument in 1923. Rights to Pipe Springs water were divided evenly between the three groups that first met here in the mid-19th century. Kaibab Paiutes, Mormon cattlemen, and the federal government. Today, Pipe Spring National Monument tells the story of vastly different cultures encountering one another on the high desert. It's up to us to pass it to the next generation and the next generation after that, just so there is that knowledge carried on. Pipe Spring and the fort there stands as a monument, a monument to Mormon exploration, a, a monument to Native Americans who had their lands taken from them. And, and finally, uh, a monument to people in conflict trying to understand their past and trying to understand each other. <laughs>